Okay, can you do me a favor after you've done attendance? Can we hand those out? That'd be awesome. Hi everyone, how's everybody doing? Fantastic, it's the last period of the day, isn't it? Yeah? My name is Dawn Hayden. Um, I'm the Outreach and Training Coordinator for the YWCA. And I am here today to talk to you about healthy relationships. Um, what we're going to do, I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview of what to expect and what to anticipate um, for the next hour, because it's going to be jam-packed with, um, with solid information. So <clears throat> to start off with, we're going to go over a very quick stereotype exercise. And we'll move into gender roles. Um, and some basic social and cultural perceptions that, that surround us from the time that we're very little through, through our lifetimes. And um, we're going to look at, at, at gender roles and how, how we fit into that and move from there into, into relationships and how, after identifying ourselves individually, how we identify into relationships. And we're going to look at the difference between healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. Um, we're going to brainstorm together in terms of what looks healthy and what looks unhealthy. And then from there, um, we'll go over some red flag indicators. Um, we'll go over different types of abuse and what to do um, if you know someone, if a friend or a family member or if you yourself are involved in a violent situation, what to do and what resources are available. Um, and if we have time today, we're also going to do a little, uh, a little skit that kind of goes over why people stay in, in abusive relationships and why it's difficult to leave. So to get started, um, how about everybody in this room that's a man, raise your hand. All right, every, wow. Hey, no problem. Um, everybody in this room that's a female, a woman, raise your hand. All right. <laughs> Anybody in this room ever walk into a glass door? A glass door, like a sliding glass door? <laughs> has anybody ever, who in here has dogs? A dog. Anybody have more than one dog? <laughs> that's a bonus, that's two hands. Anybody, um, anybody in here ever set a school athletic record? Good job. A school athletic record. Not normally. Anybody in here? Um, anybody here receive any um, any honors from like the National Honor Society or the National Junior Honor Society? How many freshmen do we have? Sophomores. How you doing? Juniors. Seniors, all right. So from here, we're gonna, I've written my name up here and the crisis numbers for both the YWCA, it's our 24 hour hotline. Student Assault Recovery Services is located at the university and they also have a 24 hour um, crisis line and that number is right here. So if anyone would like to write that down, I'm about to erase it. Um, our number is 542-1944. And SARS crisis line number is 243-6559. We have trained advocates that are willing to listen 24 hours a day. And so if there's anything that comes up um, during the course of today, or if you ever think that a friend, or if yourself, or if a family member might be involved in um, an unsafe situation, or if you've got questions or concerns, please call us. And, and you can talk to, to one of our advocates. I'm going to be asking today for some group participation. We have a large group, and so if if you would like to um, to to play and uh, and participate and share, if you could just raise your hand for me, that would be awesome. When we're going to do some we're going to do some brainstorming together as a group, and so um, as we brainstorm, it's just easier if I can look at someone that has a raised hand. Um, because I, I want it to be, uh, but I want us to share ideas and I want us to generate ideas of, of what we think um, is going on. There also might be some um, personal discussion today. We're going to be talking about some pretty serious um, situations in terms of relationships. And all of us in, our, in this room, whether it be somebody sitting next to you or in front of you or behind you, um, 
we don't know what, what our own personal histories are. And so if something is shared, I'm going to ask that we share in very non-specific, non non-naming ways, um, where I once saw this relationship that, uh, where he physically hit her, and, and not name, you know, my cousin Jim, um, <laughs> And my, you know, and my my aunt Sally. Like, I'd rather not have any specific names. I'd also like for all of us to honor and respect everyone in this room. So I'm going to ask for uh, everyone to raise their hands in an agreement of confidentiality to just keep what happens in this room in here. How about it? Oh gosh, and then we're on MCAT. <laughs> all right. Well, um, so please be non-specific in your um, in in sharing um, examples. So in stereotypes, let's look at when we hear the term senior, what comes to mind? Grandma. What's that? Older. Older. Senior is in 12th grade. Spanish 18. What are some general stereotypes that surround um, being a senior? Controlling, lazy, any positive stereotypes about seniors? Fun, Fun. <coughs> wild, <Truthless>. bossy, <coughs> self-centered. Okay, we're gonna hop down. We're gonna we're gonna go down a few years, okay? To freshmen. Stop it, annoying. Annoying. Small. Small. What else? Immature. Immature. Noisy. Noisy. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the premise of this is that all of us that enter high school are going to enter as freshmen. You have one? Okay, so easy. So, so as freshmen, like when we all enter high school, we've got, there are some general stereotypes that we, are on, that we automatically come into school facing. And hopefully everyone that enters as a freshman is going to graduate as a senior and are gonna, and are gonna face these stereotypes. Like these surround us every day just walking into school. Um, and this is, just, this is just the beginning of the way that stereotypes affect our lives. Because stereotypes happen within school and just within, with, with age and with the difference in our age and ageism. And it goes into, it reaches into other aspects of our life, whether it be um, stereotypes about religion or race or gender. And we're going to get into specific gender roles and kind of what society and culture and tells us about, about gender. Like, growing up, do we have a family that, <clears throat> what does our family think, you know, about, about the role of a man and the role of a woman? Um, what do the movies tell us that the perfect man is or the perfect woman? What do, um, what do magazines and new newspapers tell us and share with us? So when we look at this, I'm going to do the ideal man and the ideal woman. And I'm going to put them in very, very perfectly square boxes. <laughs> it's very square. And we're going to start off with what, what do we think, what are the messages that we get about what the perfect man is? He's buff. He's tall. He's dark. He's funny. He will make you laugh. He's funny, ha ha. He's romantic. He is so sweet, isn't he? Outgoing. He's outgoing. So he's outgoing. He's proud. He's confident, huh? He's sure of himself. <coughs> he's redhead. 
He's rich. He has got some cash money. He's athletic. What's his um What's his like what's he like with what's that? He's good with kids. So he's a he's a good father. How's this, uh, this guy's rich, is he a hard worker? Yeah. No, he doesn't. He just has to have money? He's a, he's a hard worker. Law school, he's a lawyer. Um, how is he in terms of like making decisions? He, he's confident, so he's pretty decisive. Not wishy-washy. <laughs> He's respectful. How about when it comes to when it comes to relationships and when it comes to sex? Does he He's ex, is he experienced? He has to be good. So He's he's experienced and equipped. And he's honest. And trustworthy. All right. Now, let's talk about the ideal woman. <clears throat> she, what does she, what does she look like? She's got it. How about a hand? Where's a hand? All right, how about right there? She's blonde. She's skinny. Blue eyes. She's uh, she's busty. Is that what I just heard? Curves. Hourglass. She's curvy. Tan. What is her personality? What is this ideal woman's personality like? She's smart. Guys, what do you what do you look for in the perfect woman? A good mom? Interesting? What makes her interesting? She has a sense of humor. She's funny too. She's not a slut. So she's inexperienced. Or innocent? Is she um, is she gonna be aggressive? Yes. No. No. <laughs> She's a good cook. She she rocks at cooking. She loves it. She's flexible. <laughs> talking about like physically flexible or is she like flexible in terms of being agreeable and she's she can work with people both of them okay we'll just leave it as that um we've got inexperienced and innocent okay so here we've got kind of a couple of pictures of what the ideal man looks like and what the ideal woman looks like I mean, this isn't necessarily what we personally think, but it's kind of the messages that we get on a daily basis. Now, what happens when we take, we take these, um, these boxes and we take a, little, a couple things out and we change a couple things? For instance, this ideal man 
he is, yeah, he's not buff anymore. Um, he is not confident, not outgoing. He's got, he doesn't have any money. Maybe he's studying. I mean, you know, maybe he's, he's looking into something, but he doesn't have, he, he doesn't have money. Um, what is that? He's a hard worker. He doesn't, he has a hard time making decisions and um, let's just say he's not athletic. What happens when we take this guy and we take him from being buff to all of a sudden he can't even lift a dumbbell? What is, what, what, what is, it, what is this perfect man called now? A nerd. What else is he? A wimp? He's not outgoing. He, he's he's oh, he's boring. Shy, average. What else? Okay. How about um, how about this ideal woman? Um, she can still cook, but she is, she's just shaved her head. She's just put on 40 pounds. Um, she, she, her, her back was killing her, and so she got a reduction. Um, and she, she, she has actually been involved in a few relationships, so she does actually have some, um, some experience. And she's not, yeah, I mean, she's not so smart. What, um, what happens when we all of a sudden, when we, when, we put a, when we put a few pounds on her and we cut off all of her hair, what does society call her? Cow. A cow? <laughs> what, uh, what else? Weird, ugly, ugly. a slut. Well, you you said single, right? She said slut. Single. What else? Is there anything else you can think of? Okay. So the general idea is that. <clears throat> We've got these we've got these ideals that we're that we're brought up with that surround us all the time. Whether or not we really necessarily want to pay attention to them, they exist. And when we start to when we just kind of step out of what the social ideal is, we face some type of stereotyping or some type of ostracization by somebody in society. And not very many of these were very positive. And so it's it's a, it can be kind of hard to step out of the box. And, you know, we've got nerd, wimp, boring, shy, all these assumptions about an individual just because they don't fit into a societal norm um, and what, it, what society kind of says is ideal and perfect. And when we grow up, we've got to figure out where, you know, where do, we, where do we fit into this? Like, where do we fit into, do, do we want to be do we want to be an ideal man? Do we want to be the ideal woman? Or can we be, can we be ideal, can we set our own ideal and have that ideal share things that are both inside and outside of that box and be independent and be confident in, in the way that we feel and the way that we are and who we are regardless of what society tells us should be perfect. So there's, there's some the, there's some stereotyping that occurs and this also sets up a dynamic where the ideal man has got to be confident and he's got to be a hard worker and he's got to be decisive and athletic and the, the ideal woman has got to be, she's got to be like flexible, agreeable, she's got to be a little bit more passive, she's got to be, a, um, she's got to be <coughs> outgoing and inexperienced and there's, there's a dichotomy that's set up there in terms of who we are and how we can and, and how we can be um, ourselves within the gender roles that society gives us. Does that make sense to everybody?
Yes. Does anyone have any questions about that? No. Okay. So when we so we've got to figure out where we fit in to you know who we are and, and what we're what we're going to be about what we're going to stand for who we're going to be and what we're going to you know and be confident in um, and empowered within our with our own decisions and in learning that we also have to learn how to relate to other people and how and how to have relationships and healthy relationships um, and to have a healthy relationship is something that we've got to learn. Um, it's not something that, you know, where, where we're born with it. I remember when I was little and I, um, I pecked somebody on the cheek on the school bus and I thought that he was going to be my, boy, be my boyfriend. I was, I was in kindergarten <laughs> and like obviously not in a place where I could develop a, a healthy relationship. Um, because we have to learn those things and we're, we're, and we're continually growing and growing into ourselves and, and we have to grow into relationships like that. Where do you think we get, where do you think we learn what a healthy relationship is? From, from our parents? TV. From our parents, from TV? Dr. From Dr. Phil? He would be on TV or in O Magazine. Where else do we learn about healthy relationships? From our friends? School and experience, okay. Older siblings. So there are a lot of models out there that we can look at and we can look at, at, at establishing what is, what is healthy and how a healthy relationship functions. But a lot of us don't grow up with a healthy relationship model in our own homes. And so I want to define a healthy relationship. I want to look at what the dynamics are and what constitutes a healthy relationship. So relationships are based on a foundation of multiple principles. What are the principles that, um, that serve for healthy relationships? Trust and respect. Trust and respect. Honesty. Commitment, freedom, compromising, responsibility, shared responsibility. Okay. Communication. How is this communication going to look? Between, between partners, what kind of communication are they going to share? <laughs> They're going to communicate with that? <laughs> they can. We'll put that, we'll put that up in one second. They're com with communication, it's going to go between both parties and it's going to be it's going to be safe for both partners to share their feelings and their emotions with the with the other partner because they're going to have mutual trust, mutual respect, they're going to have um, freedom, they're going to care about each other, they're going to be able to communicate openly without fear um, being being present in that in that dynamic. Along the lines of shared responsibility, back up Yeah, shared, okay. Shared and individual. And they have to have, as I, I heard, I heard good sex, so like mutual attraction. What else? Uh, caring. caring? Sharing. Sharing. My handwriting is lousy today. Vulnerability. What kind of vulnerability? <laughs> Well, they're gonna they're gonna be able to um, they're gonna be able to be vulnerable with them with each other. I mean, they're gonna be able to open themselves to each other because they're gonna be in, in a safe in a safe place to do that. What do you think this um, like with commitment with a healthy relationship? How is that commitment established? Want 
also uh, working towards maybe um, understanding, okay? And what about this commitment piece? How is that commitment going to be established in a healthy relationship? <coughs> like how do, you, how do you form a commitment with, like with a friend or with a partner? How does that, does that commitment, like does it happen, does it happen overnight? So it takes time learning about each other and learning to understand each other. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve over time. So it's going to be, there's going to be friendship. Right. You've got to, you've got to, like these, like trust and respect is something that, I believe that we can respect everyone, but we need to, we really need to be able to trust that person. If they're giving us reasons not to trust them, then they're, they're, not, they're not trustworthy. Okay, in an unhealthy relationship, the picture looks a little bit different. There's violence. Disrespect. Dishonesty. Jealousy. I'm going to capitalize jealousy, okay? And I'm going to circle jealousy. Jealousy is the number one indicator for a potentially abusive um, relationship. So it's something to pay particular attention to. I'm not talking about like being jealous because you know your best friend just got a brand new Porsche. I'm talking about being jealous and controlling over, um, over aspects of our daily lives. And we're going to go into that when we go into um, different types of abuse and we go over the power and control wheel. Okay, what else is, what else? Pain. Pain. Possessiveness. What kind of pressure? Pressure to have sex. Did somebody say abuse earlier? Yeah. Can we go over a couple different types of abuse? What are the what are the types of abuse that exist? Physical. Verbal. Sexual. And emotional. Whoa. Can somebody give me an example of um, physical abuse? Punching. Kicking. Pulling hair. Slapping. Okay, what about verbal abuse? Okay, so, so which is actually, it's, it's against the law in Montana to have your kid, kid subject to violence in the home. So um, she just mentioned visual abuse, having your children in the home witness relationship violence and, rec and, and witness violence within the home. So we'll just put, um, subjecting or witnessing Violence, with an emphasis on kids. What's an example of verbal abuse? When they call you bad mean names. When they call you bad mean names. <coughs> you're worthless. You're stupid. You're meaningless. You're never gonna. You're gonna never. You're never gonna make anybody happy. You're lucky to have me. Um, these are different ways that that people can verbally abuse. How about sexual abuse? Any time that anyone makes you do something that you don't want to do or makes you uncomfortable in regards to sex. So that involves any unwanted touching, any, um, any unwanted gestures, um, uh, any time that somebody speaks to you in a sexual manner and it makes you uneasy, uncomfortable, it's, um, that's sexual abuse. Okay, what about emotional? Ignores your feelings. Ignores your feelings. It's one-sided, right? They're not, it's not going back and forth. They're just ignoring your, your needs and your wants. Makes 
Makes all the decisions for you. Makes all of your decisions. What kind of decisions? Can you give me an example of making a decision for somebody? What they would wear. What they would wear. How many people in the room know somebody that has controlled what somebody, what somebody that they were dating was wearing? Okay. <laughs> Telling you how to raise your kids. So instead of having shared parental responsibility, um, telling you how you're going to do it, defining your role instead of, um, instead of working together to, to define that. What does um, communication look like in this unhealthy relationship? It looks, it's, it's bad and it's not good. What makes communi what, how can communication be bad? One-sided. So it's one-sided. Or none at all. Shutting somebody out. Not listening to what they have to say. Having it be one person talking and then just hitting and not letting any conversation come back from this direction. Like here, in this healthy relationship, we've got an equal balance of communication. This, this partnership is, is balanced. On this side, with this, it, there's only one person that's, that's controlling the relationship. So instead of being balanced, it's way off balance. So you've got somebody in control, and somebody kind of stuck with their feet off of the ground, not firmly planted on anything, because they're being controlled and manipulated by a partner. If you can turn to the front page of the packets that I've handed out, our power and control wheels. And I want to go over, I want to go over this power and control wheel. How many people in this room do you, or how many people do you think involved in um, dating relationships experience violence? How many? Half? <laughs> One out of three dating relationships involve violence. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, that's a very serious, serious concern that we, that we need to pay attention to. Um, because by being aware of what a healthy relationship looks like and by making sure that we're paying attention to, to warning signs and to red flags and that we're aware of what ways that people can control, control and manipulate other individuals, by, by just being aware and educated about that and by making sure that we're involved in relationships where we've got support, we have, we have a better chance of, of having a healthy relationship. So in the power and control wheel, <clears throat> let's start off with, um, let's say, isolation and extreme jealousy. The number one indicator that I had said earlier of a potentially abusive relationship is what? Jealousy. jealousy. And how, how do people control and isolate other individuals? They, they control who your partner is friends with, um, where she or he goes, what she or he does, not letting the partner work or, um, or be involved in after school activities. If, you're, if your partner is like, you know what, I don't want you to play basketball because um, you're cutting into my time. I love you so much that I want to spend that time with you. And so you need to, you need to give that up because I love you, baby, and I need you to, I need you to be with me instead of um, following your your athletic dreams. Um, if somebody is keeping constant tabs on you, um, continually checking on you, who did you talk to today? You know, f watching you in between classes, making sure that you're not talking to um, the new kid that just moved here that they think that you're attracted to. Um, being controlling in terms of what you do, always making the decisions about where you're going to go to dinner, what movie you're going to see. We want to make sure that your relationship is looking like this and is balanced. If you're having a rough day, then the other person can, can help you out and can, and can give to you. So this can be unbalanced once in a while. But overall, you want it to be a give and take and a fair sharing. Here, there's a lot more taking 
um, then then there is there is giving, and there's a there's a um, from the the perpetrator side of it because somebody in this relationship is going to be controlling it and dominating it. Um, denying, minimizing, and blaming. Denying the abuse or acting like it's not that serious. If you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend that is um, being abusive, whether they're being physically abusive, verbally abusive, sexually abusive, emotionally abusive, and then they're denying it and saying that you're making too much out of it. Um, an example, like say, I'm going to make up some names. Um, Christine <clears throat> was late getting out of class. She had to turn a paper in to a teacher. And she was supposed to meet her boyfriend in the parking lot at 2.15. It was, a, it was an early out day. And she got to the parking lot, but she was a little bit late. And he already had the car running, and he was livid. And so he told her to get in and shut up. So she gets in to the car because she, she didn't mean to upset him, you know. She's really, really sorry and she wants to make it up to him somehow. And he tears down South Avenue going 105 miles an hour as a deer jumps out in front of the car. He swerves and then all of a sudden starts laughing and says, that was a close call. And she doesn't know if she's going crazy, if it was just a joke, or if she should really be terrified. and and she's probably second guessing herself in there a little bit like well I was late did I deserve that well the, no one ever deserves that okay no one ever deserves to be physically verbally sexually or emotionally abused no one does but it can be really confusing when the abuser is continually denying the fact that that abuse is even real or that it's even happening when he when um, when he or she minimizes that abuse and portrays it as being something that isn't such a big deal you know, or, or blaming, the, blaming the partner, you know, where, say, um, Vicky got mad at her boyfriend because, um, because he happened to walk past a cheerleader as he was going out into the football field. And so afterwards, she tells him that she's not going to talk to him, that he's not going to touch her, that she, and she's thinking about committing suicide. She's trying to, she's trying to control him in a way that, um, that is blaming him for for doing something that what like he wasn't doing anything wrong but yet she's she's kind of switching that blame around do those examples are, are they okay examples do they make any sense at all um, intimidation and threats um, using looks um, uh, or carrying out threats to someone physically or sexually threatening to leave um, throwing things smashing things breaking things or play fighting that, you know, like a lot of us like play wrestle and play fight, but when it gets taken to a point where that play fighting is being used to show who has got more power and more strength over the other individual, um, because there's a line, and if we, I mean, intuitively we can listen and we know when that line is crossed. And when it goes from being playful to being a power act, we need to, we need to register that as being very real and being something that we should be concerned about. Emotional and verbal abuse, constant criticism, um, name calling put downs, playing mind games, embarrassing or humiliating a partner, the silent treatment, spreading rumors. Has anybody ever had a friend that's, um, that's spread a rumor about an ex-partner that wasn't true just to hurt them? Has anyone... Um, has anyone ever seen a relationship where somebody is continually criticizing somebody else? It, it stinks, doesn't it? Like when you've got somebody who's continually criticizing somebody that you care about, or if somebody's continually criticizing you, that takes away some personal power. It takes away um, a, a little bit of the essence of who we are and what we're, what we're you know, striving to be. Um, sexual coercion. We talked about sexual abuse a little bit up here, and I want to go over, um, go over sexual coercion as it appears in this power and control wheel that we're using today. It says manipulating your partner into sex, including using guilt trips or threats. Specific examples. Baby, if you loved me, um, you'd have sex with me. 
or you know I can't wait forever I've got needs and so you're either gonna you're either gonna put up or you're gonna get out um, unwanted touching touching when you don't want them to touch you and feeling respond like you have to let them touch you as soon as you feel uneasy or uncomfortable it it's uh, it switches into a sexual um, abuse category when you treat your partner like a sex object um, when you pressure your partner for sex or while if you drug someone or you have sex when they're too drunk or high to make a clear de decision about whether they're going to have sex this is something that I, I that I want to make pretty clear in terms of um, the Montana state law sexual intercourse without consent is the legal definition for rape and a part of that definition is that um, that consent cannot be given if a party is incapacitated which means if they're too intoxicated or if they're too high to give consent then it's constituted as um, as sexual intercourse without consent so that's important for us in in growing up whether um, if you are going to be using alcohol alcohol is the number one date rape drug that there is it's the number one date rape drug and if somebody is incapacitated because of liquor and somebody somebody uses predatory behavior to take advantage of somebody who is intoxicated that is that's it's it's wrong and it's against the law okay so we need to be very very careful and date rape drugs exist here in Missoula we have GHP we have Rehibinol we um there there's currently the crime lab has found Valium and antihistamines being used for date rape drugs and so the existence of date rape drugs within our county is real and it's out there and so if you if you have if you happen to wake up you go to a party and you have even if you have a glass of water and all of a sudden you wake up the next day and you've completely blacked out if you feel groggy or like if you have flu like symptoms or if a friend of yours all of a sudden shows really gregarious bubbly behavior and doesn't really remember anything and you believe that you've been sexually assaulted call um, first step which is a program at st. Pat's Hospital it's a multi-agency sexual assault response team then and they can they can test to find out if you've um, if you've had date rape drugs and if you are concerned medically about STDs and um, sexually transmitted diseases or ab about what actually happened um, there are people out there in the community that can support you through that entire process so that's it's really important for everyone in this room to know that um, for the women in this room that might go to bars or the parties in the future if you're to defend yourself against date rape drugs make sure that your glass is always with you stay close to your friends and to people that you trust and support about you go out in groups um, with people that that you trust and um, and make sure that you're you know you're partnering up that you're that you've got a designated driver or that you've made um, you're gonna take a taxi and that or a cab and make sure that you're that you're not ever leaving a friend with with a stranger or with somebody that they don't know so those are just those are just a few of the things that I could think of to be preventive um, in terms of uh, in terms of going out and staying safe but it's never ever um, it's never ever the the survivors fault ever if um, if you are physically abused if you're verbally abused if you're sexually abused if you're emotionally abused it is not your fault that that abuse happened whoever is doing the abuse whoever is doing the assault whoever has made they have made that decision and it's and it's their fault regardless of you know if if you were 10 minutes late or if something wasn't perfect or you weren't the perfect partner that doesn't matter um, abuse is is not there's no excuse for a, a, abuse and that person is making a decision to um, to be abusive and it's not it's not your fault okay um, financial and economic abuse preventing your partner from getting or keeping a job um, keeping your partner on an allowance 
maybe having the bills all in your part in in uh, in one person's name and the checking or savings account is in somebody else's name, so that there isn't a, somebody's responsible for all the bills, but they don't have any money because the other partner has control over it. Um, expecting the partner to always pay for dates or for things that um, or to buy you things, using someone for their money. Um, I think that that might have come up earlier in our our ideal man and ideal woman list in terms of, uh, or maybe, no, it actually didn't, but in unhealthy, using people for their money um, is unhealthy. Or expecting sexual acts in return for spending money on a partner. So if you're going out to eat and you're going to a really nice restaurant, um, in a healthy relationship you're doing that out of, you know, because you care and you want to you wanna have a good time, you want to go out for a nice meal. In an unhealthy relationship, if you're going out for a really nice meal and you're expecting to get sexual favors from that meal, that's unhealthy. Okay, like there, there shouldn't be that kind of, there shouldn't be a price on things like that. Um, sexism, discrimination based on gender, using the belief that males are superior to females or that males have certain privileges that females should not have to justify controlling a partner or being the person to define male and female roles. Being a female that defines the male's roles in where the female's in control of that relationship is wrong. So defining, um, being the one to define those roles um, and expecting, expecting one of the people in that relationship to make all the decisions or, or deciding that um, one person is gonna make all the decisions of where you're gonna go um, out to eat, what you're gonna see, what, what the, your partner's gonna wear, what activities they can be involved in. It, what, um, how long they can study for, what classes they're going to take, maybe what college they're going to go to. If they were thinking about they really wanted to go um, out of state and telling them that they can't go out of state, or they really wanted to stay in state and, and go to the University of Montana, and their partner forces them to, to leave the state and tells them that, you know, that they're going to make a, a threat to leave them and to hurt them themselves or, or one of their family members. And, the last one is using children, um, pressuring your partner to um, to get pregnant or to use your children ag against your partner. I'm going to call Child Protective Services. I'm going to kidnap your child or take your ch take that child away from you. Um, you're crazy, and I'm going to take that child away. That's that's a way that's a way that people can get power and control within a relationship. Are there any questions about the power and control wheel? No? I want to quickly do a couple red flags um, of things to look for in terms of an abusive relationship. Um, if your partner has very controlling behaviors, okay, like trying to control who you see, what you do, um, who you talk to, and what you say when you do talk to someone, that's a, con that's a red flag and you need to, to pay attention to that. If your partner has severe mood swings, um, is like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one minute extremely happy and then one minute extremely angry. Um, if there are severe mood swings, you need to just you need to pay attention to that as uh, as just as an indicator of not all these things individually will constitute um, a, a, an abusive relationship, but these are red flags that we need to really we need to be serious about and we need to look at in our relationships. Hurtful teasing. We grew up in a society that teases. We get teased as little kids, we tease as little kids, we tease through high school, we tease as adults. But when there's a, there's a line between teasing and hurtful teasing, where you're humiliating, criticizing, and really demeaning an individual. And so as soon as the teasing is used to hurt someone, or if someone is hurt by that teasing, it's, you should just pay attention to that and keep a heads up. <coughs> Quick involvement. We had talked about in a healthy relationship where, um, where this commitment was going to be built on a friendship and that trust has to be earned and it takes time. Oftentimes in unhealthy and abusive relationships, the involvement is very, very quick. I'm not going to like walk down the street one day and be like, hey, baby, you want to get involved in a really serious relationship with me like today? You want to start now? Like it, it, but that does happen. Like people do do that, except that it normally doesn't end up being a healthy relationship. It's um, when, you, when there's quick involvement, the faster you get into something, the harder it is to, to pull out and all of a sudden you're in over your head and you, you can kind of feel like you're drowning almost and like you can't get out. If your partner's tracking your whereabouts, like 
where you are, where you're spending all of your time. Um, they're not letting you, they're not sharing respect and letting you kind of have your own life and be independent. If they're tracking whereabouts, that's a concern. Gifts. Now, I'm not saying that gifts are bad. Everybody likes a little chocolate every once in a while. Um, flowers are nice, too, and river rocks. But if your partner is giving you gifts after you've had a fight and after there's been an explosion, or like say um, your partner has just physically um, hit or kicked you, and then the next day shows up and says, I am, I'm sorry, I love you so much, and I promise that is never going to happen again. And I got you a little something and brings you, um, I don't know, tickets to a, a football game you wanted to go to, or um, tickets to a movie, or something that you've wanted, a favorite CD, to make up for, um, for behavior that was wrong. That's, that's a concern, OK? Lack of responsibility. When a person is not taking responsibility for their own actions, and they're not responsible for what they say or what they do, and they try to minimize and blame and turn it on you, um, that's a sign that the power and control in that relationship is a little bit off. And last but not least, jealousy. OK, if your partner is jealous, um, is an overly jealous, and, one in, and using jealousy is saying, I, I love you so much. I just need to be with you always. And I need, and your friends, I, and using this jealousy to isolate you from your friends and from the people that you care about. Um, when you start to feel like you're, you're being isolated and you're pulled away by a person because they're jealous, that's something to, to pay attention to. OK, there's just a few more minutes left. Um, and there are two things I need to go over. So <clears throat> first, I want to say that um, I want to thank you for being very patient through this and for um, listening attentively and for sharing. I want to also talk about what, what happens if you know someone that is involved in an unhealthy relationship. And if you've got, a, if you yourself or a friend or a family member um, is involved in an unhealthy relationship, what you can do is, if a friend discloses to you that they have been physically or sexually assaulted or that they're being abused by a partner, believe them, support them. Um, they, they need that support and they need you to believe them because Chances are they've been so demeaned time and time again that they don't have that power there, and they need your support. See if, make yourself educated and aware. Know, know what physical violence is, what sexual violence is, what emotional violence is, and what they look like, and, what, um, and know behavior signs that can indicate um, that something's going wrong in a relationship. If a friend of yours that you've been friends with from the time that you were six is all of a sudden withdrawing from you, and there's nothing specific you can pinpoint it on, but all of a sudden just got into a dating relationship, pay attention to those signs and pay attention to the red flags we went over. Um, talk to, I want everyone in this room um, to consciously make a decision to find, to pick one adult in their life that they trust enough to go to if they are ever physically or sexually assaulted or if they are ever emotionally or verbally abused? Is there one adult that you trust enough to go to, whether it be a family member, whether it be a teacher, a counselor? I want everybody to pick somebody. And I'm going to put our hotline up here once again. And it's on the brochures that you've gotten. But this is our 24-hour hotline. So if you have any questions, I want you to, to call and ask questions, OK? And talk to, you know, talk with Tracy and Operation Success and see um, what information we, we are able to get together in the next week. If, uh, if there's anything that might seem unclear or if anything makes you uncomfortable, just listen to your heart and listen to your intuition when it comes to things. Are there any questions for me right now? My name is Amanda Tripp and I'm Monica Tao. And together we are the co-presidents of Respect Club at Big Sky High School. 
Okay. To start off the week, we had an assembly, and you can start that. And then um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, we had culture, ethnicity, and on Thursday and Friday, we we're going to have um, gender and sexual orientation. And religion. And religion. At the assembly, we had three main speakers, Maggie Jimenez, Dr. Meridad Kia, and Dr. Casey Charles, followed by a parade with different various clubs represented at Big Sky High School, from Campus Life to GSA to Guts to the clubs and ethnicities in Big Sky High School. Um, one thing that was really cool about diversity week so far has been when people come in, um, when people are coming out, um, you get to see their expressions on their face. It's like, wow, it's really cool. I think this is going to be an um, eye-opening experience for everyone. This week has gone by really fast, and I think overall we're going to have a positive experience. It's going to be a positive ex experience from the Big Sky High School population and students. We have a wide variety of presentations from um, on African heritage to Polynesian culture to Christianity to a GSA panel to um, gender roles. So we're trying to represent everything that happens at Big Sky High School. We have issues also, um, the Middle East and the Middle East right now, the situation there. We're gonna have a presentation by Dr. Meridad Kia. So we have a wide variety and we hope that it gives students an opportunity to explore and appreciate all the beautiful differences at Big Sky. Um, for Dr. Meridad Kia, he, um, for his uh, presentation, there's gonna be about like 200 and 60, 260 people are going to be in the auditorium and cafeteria, which is going to be pretty cool. We've had a large turnout from Big Sky High School students coming to the presentations and classes, and students have even got their parents to sign um, uh, prearranged absence forms just to come and see these presentations. Dr. Robert Harkin, or Mr. Robert Harkins flew in from Seattle just to come and present, and um, it's been a great week so far.